Hi everyone, welcome back to Five Quote Shakespeare Othello. Today we're gonna to look at Act Two, Scene Two, and Scene Three. What I do in this series is I first give you a nutshell overview of the important plot events of each scene, and then we dive deeply into the text of each scene and pull out five quotes that I think are helpful to help you understand the play's character and themes. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe and consider, consider making a donation to my Patreon account. Act two, scene two is a bit of a throwaway scene. It's only that long. It's only basically a sonnet long. It's simply establishing that things are looking up on Cyprus. A herald announces the destruction of the Turkish fleet, yay, and the celebration of Othello, Othello's marriage to Desdemona. Um, there's not much to say about this except for the fact that, again, they drive home the fact that everyone loves Othello, so there's his reputation. Remember Peripatia? Reputation and Peripatia are two dominant themes of the whole play. Peripatia uh, meaning the the change in fortune from the reversal in fortune from condition A to condition B. At the beginning of the story, Othello is very much loved and respected, and at the end, he's 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 villain number one. Okay, so that's basically Act Two, Scene Two. So as we've seen, peace has been brought to Cyprus. Everything's kind of nice, and the evening's winding down, and we get this lovely little scene between uh, Othello and Desdemona. They're, remember, they're married, but they haven't spent an evening together yet because they've just been married. And Othello says to Desdemona, he says, the purchase made, the fruits are to ensue, that profit's yet to come between me and you. So the, the, the metaphor here is of, you know, we've bought each other, you know, we've made the purchase, we are married now, but we haven't enjoyed the fruits of that yet because we haven't been made, you know, spiritually, physically husband and wife yet. That prophet's yet to come between me and you. He's looking, he's anticipating their wedding night. Um, it's actually quite lovely, but it's also, it, it's, it's important in this, in the context of the play because it, it draws attention to uh, a very important theme that Shakespeare is exploring in this play. And it's, I've, I've talked about it a lot already in my previous videos. It's the, it's the contrast between nobility and baseness, between the high and the low aspects of what it means to be human. Uh, the ancient Greeks personified all of the higher powers, the intellect, the spirit, artistic achievement, and all that stuff in, in philosophy, in, in the god Apollo, the, the sun god. Uh, the god Dionysus Bacchus is the, the god of the lower energies, and he's, he's a very physical creature. He's the god of wine, he's the god of wild, wild revels, almost the exact opposite of Apollo. The ancient Greeks understood that both of these forces are forces, and they're forces that we must respect in their turn. Now the problem is, is that in Iago, all we've got is the ugly. We've got the crude vulgarity of the Dionysian. Uh, in someone like Hamlet, you know, to, to be fair to poor old Dionysus, to, to someone like Hamlet, as I've mentioned before, he's, he tries to live in the Apollonian realm, and that's no good either. Too much of one, too much of the other is really, really not healthy. Again, one of the the themes of the play, I think, is the difference between excess versus moderation. Now, what we see in, in both Othello and Desdemona is, is um, in this case, uh, that balance. There's a danger. At the very beginning of the play, Othello is depicted as this Apollonian creature. Desdemona as well. They're really, really good people. They're noble people. The speech that they use is noble. They, they, they have noble intentions and noble goals. They're dutiful. All of these things are lovely, lovely people. And you might start to think of them as a bit of a Hamlet-esque kind of prig. Are they kind of puritanical? No, they're not. And here's evidence of it. They're going to enjoy each other physically. They're going to enjoy their physicality. They're going to enjoy the, 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 the underpowers of what it means to be human. And it's not crude and ugly. It's not. What we're going to see coming up really, really soon, Iago comes on the scene, and he's all ugly. He's all crude. And you're going to see the sharp contrast. So there's Othello. He's got a balance between the high and the low within his character, which makes him a very, very admirable character. He's a buddy you'd like to have as a buddy, and he's a husband you'd like to have as a husband. Sex and love as physical expression of the spiritual. Shakespeare said again and again uh, in many of his sonnets and his other plays, he's expressed the theme that true love is the marriage of true minds without neglecting the bodily pleasures as well. Uh, again, so uh, the theme of excess versus moderation and nobility versus baseness. Speaking of baseness, Othello and Desdemona go off together and Cassio and Iago are left together on the stage and Iago tries to engage Cassio in some locker room, crude locker room banter. It doesn't work. Cassio is, is too good a person. He's naive and foolish, but he's also a good person. We, we, we can see, well, he's, there are other, he's, he's got some problems we'll talk about later on. 
but he's been basically a good person, and he only sees the good in Desdemona. And so when Iago tries to to uh, to to engage in this kind of crude banter, uh, Iago shuts him down and says things like, "Yes, she is a most ex exquisite lady." So the first thing Iago says here is uh, he hath not yet made want in the night with her. So he's, he's, he's imagining them in the bedroom. He's obsessed with sex in, in a really crude way that nobody else on, uh, in, in this play is. Not even, not even pathetic Rodrigo. He's a really gross guy. Okay? He, has not, he hath not yet made want in the night with her. And she is sport for Zeus. She is sport for Jove. So he's, he's, he's ribbing Cassio here, trying to say, isn't she hot? She's hot. Uh, and Cassio replies, you know, uh, like a gentleman, she's a most exquisite lady. And I'll warrant, full of game. Do you see this? Indeed, she's a most fresh and delicate creature. Again, like a gentleman. Uh, and what an eye she has. Methinks her eye sounds a parlay of provocation. I think her eye is God. She's trying to seduce all the men that, she's, uh, that, that, that she encounters. Crude, crude, crude. And, he, and Cassio says, methinks she's modest. Isn't it not when she speaks? Isn't her voice an alarm to love? Isn't, doesn't she arouse everybody? She is perfection, Cassio responds. Well, happiness to their sheets, he, he, he finishes off. Do you see it? There, there's the, the banter back and forth, back and forth, the negative, the positive, the good, the bad, the good, the bad, all through this, the crude, the noble, the crude, the noble is, is, is being, there's, there's a leapfrogging all throughout this little scene here. There's a contrast, there's a juxta, juxtaposition of the, two, of the two characters, the Cassio, the good man, and the Iago, the crude man. So their character foils for each other. Iago, of course, being a foil for both, uh, for, for everybody in the play, really, because he's so horrible. So we see here Iago, the crude, the vulgarian. We see Cassio, the good-natured guy. We also see him as, a, as having a weak sense of self. Now that comes up shortly after this, after this kind of locker room banter that they engage in or Iago engages in. Iago tries to convince him to drink. Do you see, his part of Iago's plan is to have Cassio get drunk and to make a fool out of Cassio so that he'll lose his position. Look at the ridiculous peer pressure that Iago gives him straight out of grade eight. Look, what man? Tis a night of revels. The gallants de desire it. Cassio say, no, 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 I don't want to drink. I'm not a good drinker. I don't, I've already had one drink and that's enough for me. Moderation, moderation. That's all I need. And he peer pressures him and he follow, he, f he falls for it. Cassio gives into it. And so that's why I argue that, that Cassio must have a weak sense of self. He, he's got some other problems going on, but in this case, I think it's, there's a weak sense of self. Uh, it, it's evident, it's evident. Um, otherwise, he would have you know, just said, no, I don't, I don't want another drink. We see here love as esteem, okay, versus love as mere sex. That's how Iago sees, sees the world, and I've talked about that in my other, other videos. We see excess versus moderation. There's nothing wrong with, uh, with, with physical love, as we've just seen. Physical love is lovely. But if all you know is the physical side of, of, of male-female relations, then you're, you're, you're a half-creature, you're a goat. Um, we see nobil no the nobility of Cassio, perhaps the naive nobility of Cassio that we don't see in Othello yet. We see other, other aspects of, of, uh, of so a downside to Othello's goodness um, coming up soon. And of course, the baseness of Othello. We see what we want to see. That's one of my main themes. I like that as well. Shakespeare talks about this all the time. It's a kind of projection. We project onto the world the, the ideas that we have in our mind. We don't see the world as it really is. We see the world as we expect to see it or as we want to see it. And here we see what we expect to see. Iago's soul is a swamp and he sees the world as a swamp. He projects onto the world that swamp. Cassio's soul is a, is a, is a heavenly palace and he projects onto the world that heavenly palace, certainly in the terms that he uses to describe someone that he very much esteems, do you see? And of course, the old theme um, that we've been talking about, language reveals character. The language that we use reveals what's in our souls. One more thing I wanna talk about in this really interesting passage here is the use of contrast and how cool it is. You've all heard your teachers talk about um, contrast. You know, artists use it all the time, musicians, visual artists, writers juxtaposition, putting two opposing elements next to each other to draw out the differences in each. And that's all very, very true, of course. Um, characters are often juxtaposed against each other. Iago is juxtaposed uh, uh, um, against everyone in the whole play. He's a character foil for everyone, I suppose, because he's such a horrible character. Um, in this case here, we see the two, the two aspects. We see the noble and the ignoble, the noble and the vulgar contrasted with each other. And sex is at the center of it. The, the notion of, of physical love is at the center of it. And when you, in, in one instance, sex is considered 
gross and crude and vulgar and bestial. And in the other instance, as we've seen up here, it's actually quite noble and it's, it's lovely and it's something that we all hope that we can, we can achieve in our lifetimes. And I thought, as I was reading the, preparing these lectures, I thought of Van Gogh. I read somewhere that Van Gogh understood blue, as, uh, blue uh, yellow rather, as, as a color of optimism and hope and joy. Uh, and, and when he was feeling in those moods, he, he, had a, he, had a, he had a lot of weird moods, as you might be aware of. Uh, he, he expressed uh, uh, yellow. He used yellow to express that kind of joy of being alive. And we can see that very, very clearly in these paintings. There's something that there's, there, there's an eminence. There, there's an there's a internal life and vitality that is emanating from these paintings that comes predominantly from yellow, but not just from yellow. It's the contrast between the yellow and the blue. It's the environment that yellow finds itself in that produces that, 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 that humane uh, and joyful glow. Because, look at this. Here's yellow. I think it's almost the same yellow. I'm probably wrong about that. I'm no painter. But it's, it's a similar yellow to what we saw in the other paintings. Here, obviously, it does not represent vitality and joy. Look at these figures. They're all miserable. It's a really dim, dismal, uh, um, gross... Uh, vulgar, joyless, you know, look, the guy's, he has his hands in his pockets. There's no vitality in this room whatsoever. And in this case, the yellow is lurid. It's lurid. It's not something that represents joy. So what's my point? It's exactly the same thing that's happening here in this play. Sex is like that. In one environment, in the blue environment, we can think of Desdemona and Othello as that blue environment, that blue, the optimism and the joy. And when we think of sex in Iago's world, it's that lurid, uh, gross, vulgar, um, distasteful, uh, bestial experience. Uh, really, really interesting. And Shakespeare's playing with that. He knows he's he's putting the two the two forces against each other. In this scene, he left us with this the ringing of the joy up here, and then he immediately plunges us into this lurid scene of the bar room. Cool, eh? Come on, Cassio, have a drink with us. Have a drink with the lads. Have a drink with the gallants, says Iago to weak-willed Cassio, who bows to the peer pressure. Uh, it's straight out of grade eight, which suggests some kind of character weakness with Cassio. Now, remember, Shakespeare is very good at depicting people as they are and not explaining backstories. Uh, we do. We meet people like this, and we wonder why would Cassio? What is it in Cassio's character that would that would make him so susceptible to this grade eight level of kind of peer pressure? Okay, so he says, "I'll do it," but it dislikes me. Okay, so the stage is set. He's got Cassio ready to go. Um, then Cassio leaves, and Iago's alone on the stage, and we get his second soliloquy. Now, the soliloquies in this in this play, to be honest, are not great um, compared to the great soliloquies of Hamlet and Macbeth and some of the other plays. Uh, they don't reveal all that much. There, there's not a lot of great poetry in them. This basically is just all plot exposition. Uh, kind of boring. He just says, um, yeah, I got to get Cassio drunk, because when he's drunk, he's ready for a fight. I've got Rodrigo out on the watch with three other guys who are also drunk and ready for a fight. I'm going to have Rodrigo stir up trouble with Cassio so that Cassio is going to start a brawl with them. And then the, uh, then the chips will fall where they're going to fall after that. Hopefully, Cassio will lose his position because he'll be humiliated. Uh, the only thing of any significance I can pull out of here, really, uh, is, is words like this. Like Language reveals character. Now, amongst the, this flock of drunkards, look at, the, 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 look at the, the, the dismissive, derisive language he uses for this. Uh, that's, that reveals Iago's psychopathology, I think. He's, he's, he, that's the arrogance of the psychopath. He sees himself as a puppet master and all these other little minor creatures. Are f it's a flock of drunkards, do you see? So there's, there's the elevation. There's the, it's, like, it's, it's like Voldemort. It's a Voldemortarian kind of statement for him to think of people in these terms. He's a manipulator. He sees people only uh, as, as, people, as, as objects that he can use and uh, for his own entertainment, for his own amusement, really. So Cassio with Montano and the gentleman enter and the party gets started. And here Iago shows himself. If you have to, you have to watch a stage version of this. Iago shows himself to be very, very charismatic. As I've mentioned in previous videos, he's incredibly charismatic. He's likable. He's a psychopath 
but you, dear viewer, would probably love being around this guy. He's a lot of fun to be around. He, 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 he would fool you. When we watch this play, we think that, oh, how, how, could these, how could Cassio and Othello be so foolish to believe Iago? You would too. You probably have. You will encounter these kinds of psychopaths in your life. They're very, very charming and charismatic. And so here Iago leads. He's the life of the party. He's leading everything. He's, he's, he's the puppet master of all of his flock of drunkards. And he starts singing these, these, these ribald, you know, bar room tunes. And everyone's having a great time, including Cassio. Okay? He's having a great time. He's singing an excellent song, an excellent song. It goes on, it goes on for a little while longer until Cassio kind of snaps out of it. He has a moment where, you know, when you're drunk, there's, there's, there's the high of the drunk, but then eventually there's the turning point where things start to crash because alcohol is a depressant after all. And I suppose that's what starts to happen with Cassio. And he becomes ashamed of himself. He becomes aware of what he's doing. Now, remember, we've seen that he is, he's an upright guy. He's dutiful. He's, he's got a very strong sense of his, his position and his role and his sense of duty. Uh, and here's where the peripatia is kicking in. Here is where the turn is happening, the reversal of fortunes. Uh, he's put himself in a vulnerable position and he knows that he's, he's, he's behaving like these, uh, these people that he doesn't really respect. Um, so he does have a sense, a weak sense of self in that he is participating and then he becomes ashamed of himself. Well, which is it, buddy? Do you see? Uh, the peer pressure... He needs that validation of the crowd. Again, we're doing some kind of minor psychoanalysis on this guy without a lot of background information. We have no idea what his backstory is. Uh, but why would you need the validation of your boys, you know, if you really did have a strong sense of self? Here we see, look at this. This is really, really interesting. He says, hey, do you want to hear it again? Do you want to hear the song again? He says, oh, that song was great, he says to Iago. Do you want to hear it again? He says, no. This is where he snaps a little bit. He says, no. Not a little bit, a lot, actually. For I hold him un to be unworthy of his place that does those things. Look at that, those things. He's inarticulate here. He's drunk and he doesn't even know what he's talking about. It's, 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 a, it's a poor, weak use of language. He's shaking himself. He's feeling gross. He's starting to feel nauseous, probably. He probably has a headache. He says, well, God's above all. Now, here's the puritanical streak that, be that begins to emerge. And there be souls must be saved. And there be souls must not be saved. So he's trying to put himself in the camp of the, 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 the nobler people who will be saved. He's trying to put himself, he sees himself as the Apollonian figure. And he sees drinking and partying and barroom songs as being of the Dionysian, of a Dionysian nature. And he doesn't like that in himself. He doesn't like it in other people. It's fine, whatever. They're lower than me. He's very much a Hamlet character in this scene. He's revealed as a very much of a Hamlet character. He's puritanical, he's snobby, he's arrogant. Uh, and as we'll see, he's, he's, he's hot-tempered. If the actor portrays this in a violent way, it's like, no, like he's, he, he, he slaps down Iago verbally here. He's quite hot-tempered, and, and, and it gets worse. Um, I, you can, I, I try to understand this. Again, I'm trying to understand Cassio's character with very little evidence. It seems like he has a weak shadow. If you, if you, if you Google you know, the Jungian shadow, it's the dark side of us. It's, the, it's the, size that had, the side of us that has power and aggression that we can harness to put to good use. When people impose upon us, okay, if we have a, a, a healthy shadow, if we've integrated that, 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 a healthy aggression, we can push people back and say, hey, leave me alone, buddy. Hey, Iago, I don't need a drink. I don't want a drink. Go and do what you want to do. I'm going to stay here. I think he's got that weak shadow. I th he can't stand up for himself. And so now he's drunk and now he's, he, he, he's, he's resentful of himself. He's full of self-hatred here because he knows he's weak. He knows he didn't want to participate in that revel. He actually said so, though it disliked me, he said, quote, unquote. Uh, and yet he went along with it. So I think he's, he's ashamed of himself here because he didn't stick up, stick up for himself when he knew that he should have. And so he lashes out now. He lashes out at everybody. But as, as he's lashing out at everybody else, it's really a lashing out at himself. He's disgusted with himself. Um, so he says, there are souls that will be saved and souls that won't be saved. And for my own part, okay, I hope to be saved. He's elevating himself above the others, even though he was just down in the muck in the Dionysian muck with these guys enjoying the, the, the ribald drinking songs, do you see? Iago tries to participate. Iago's playing around with him. He's not, he's, he hasn't drunk. He's, he's too smart for that. And he says, yeah, I'm going to be saved too. And he says, aye, but not before me. The lieutenant goes to heaven before the ancient. Do you see what he's done? He's wallowed in the muck with the ancient, with the lower ranking ancients. And he's ashamed of himself. And now he's trying to elevate himself above him. I go to heaven before you. It's weird. It's a really weird outburst. And that's why I think it comes from something really dark 
and, 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 and it's a weakness in him, do you see? A weak sense of self. He needs the validation from public opinion. And now he's ashamed that he's, had to, that, he's, that he's stooped so low. He does have a professional sense of himself. He's a professional. He's dutiful. That's his self-image. The image of himself is as the Apollonian, conscientious, dutiful uh, officer. And now he's behaving like a crude barracks soldier, do you see? That doesn't sit well with him. He, he's concerned with his reputation, and that's going to come up very, very soon when he loses his reputation. But here he sees his reputation is now on the brink. It's about to happen. He's about to lose it. The peripatia, the reversal of fortune is about to happen. Condition A, he's moving into condition B. Appearance versus reality. What did we learn about him? At the beginning of the play, we, we, we all had these noble, just very, very briefly, when he was talking nobly about Desdemona, we thought, oh, what a nice guy Cassio is. And then this weirdness comes out this really strange, bizarre behavior. So there's a bit of reality being revealed about this particular character. Another comment on excess and moderation. I don't think Shakespeare anywhere says that, you know, having a, having a drink with your friends or having a good time with your friends is necessarily an evil thing, excess, uh, except in, in excess. Okay, we can, act, we can also add the theme of uh, nobility versus baseness. Cassio sunk from the, his, his perceived, his self-image of nobility he sunk to what he perceives as as crude and Dionysian he doesn't like it in himself he's a weird guy he's a weird guy um, so and then he just before he exits you know all of them are kind of wrapping things up and he says but very well very well well here he's arguing like I'm not drunk I'm not drunk don't say that I'm drunk don't say that I'm drunk and the fact that he says don't say that I'm drunk suggests that he's obsessed with this public opinion why? Very well, then. You must not think that I am drunk, He's, he insists. But of course, it's, it's, it's the appearance of his reality, certainly. In his mind, maybe he's not, but everybody else knows that he is. So weird scene with Cassio. Weird. But again, psychologically, we can piece together um, um, why he would behave like this. Those are my thoughts anyway. Everyone's witnessed, everyone's witnessed that weirdness uh, of, of Cassio's and Iago takes the opportunity, of course Iago's planned this all out, he says, he starts to plant the seeds of doubt in everyone's mind regarding Cassio's competence as an officer, as a lieutenant. Now remember, Iago wants uh, to be Othello's lieutenant and Cassio is, is the lieutenant. So he, uh, Iago's trying to take him down. And so he uses this opportunity to start to prime his victims that's what a good psychopath does. That's what a good manipulator does. They prime people to see things so that when somebody does see something, they think that it's their own idea. Okay, I see an object and I see it in light. In, 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 I see it as X. And I think that X is coming. Is, I'm, I'm, I'm the producer of the, the notion X. But really, the idea of X was planted in my head by the manipulator. That's what manipulators do, and Iago is a master. So we see him here. He's, he, he's priming Montano, who, who's an important officer uh, in Othello's retinue as well, uh, to, to, uh, to, to see. He's priming Montano to see, to, whenever he looks at Cassio, to see a drunkard, do you see? To see a drunkard. More and more, Cassio is, is, is using drink as a prologue to his sleep. He's trying to plant the seeds in Montano that Cassio is an alcoholic, do you see? Appearance versus reality. It's, it's very, very clever. It's very, very duplicitous. It's very, very manipulative. It's very, very psychopathic. Uh, but it's genius. It's what people do. You will probably in your lifetime at some point you'll fall victim to this kind of manipulation. It's because we will encounter these people either in our families, hopefully not, uh, but certainly somewhere in your work in your work experience. The manipulator, the manipulator primes the victim to project a false image onto the world. Do you see? Uh, and then the, the 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 manipulator presents the self as a concerned ally. This is what he does right here. He's constant for the next couple of for the rest of the scene. I'll, I'm going to return to this. He says things like, "I do love Cassio well." Oh, and I would do much to cure him of this evil, this alcoholism. Pure, pure lies. He's presenting himself as the, as the concerned ally. So often people do this. Uh, it's so disingenuous. It's so manipulative. It's duplicitous. It's psychopathic. It's psychopathic. Be aware of this. People who, people, those who, those who preach the most virtue are probably guilty of the most vice. Do you see? It's 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 a it's Shakespeare knew he knows he knows he knew people he knew them so so well. Okay, so poor Montano now has been his mind has been twisted to see uh, um, poor Cassio in a certain light. His plan is working. Iago's plan is working. 
There is a cry within, help, help. So here comes the brawl that Iago had masterminded. Montano, Cassio, and Rodrigo are all fighting, and Montano actually gets hurt pretty badly. Um, so they fight, they fight, they fight. Othello, the angry father, storms in and say, what are you up to? What's going on? This island is recently was just at war. It's agitated enough, and you guys are disturbing the peace. What is going on? He goes around and he asks everybody, you know, you know, you know Michael Cassio, how did you forget yourself? Uh, Cassio is too drunk and exhausted here. He can't speak. Now, that's a convenient little plot point because Cassio can't speak for himself. So who's going to speak for him? Honest Iago, and we'll see how that goes, of course. Um, he asks Montano to speak, but Montano can't speak either, conveniently. Again, a little plot device, maybe a bit of a cheat. Is it a bit of a cheat on, on Shakespeare's part? Maybe, because Shakespeare wants to get Iago to speak, uh, uh, to explain what happened, of course. But he's, he's, he's hurt, and that's actually, that's not a cheat. Sure, he's hurt. He can't, he can't, uh, and, and Cassio can't handle his, his alcohol either, so maybe that, that makes sense that he can't, he cannot speak. Anyway, quite convenient. Um, now, by heaven, I will find out what's going on here, and whoever caused this is going to feel my wrath. You will lose me. The person who, who, no matter if we were brothers, if we were twins, I shall divorce you. You shan't be in my favor anymore. So it's, the, the stakes are pretty high here, okay? So the only, per the only person left to talk is Iago. And, he, and, and, and as we've seen before, he lies by telling the truth. Everything he said, nothing he says here is a lie. It's all how it all, lay, it, it all played out. Uh, but of course, if you're, if you're a truly brilliant psychopath, your, your truths will tell lies at the same time. There's the duplicitousness, the manipulativeness, the psychopathology, the manipulator. The manipulator primes the victim to project a false image and presents himself as an ally. Look what he says here. I had rather have this tongue cut from my mouth than it should do offense to Michael Cassio. So he's saying, please, 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 Othello, don't make me speak ill of Cassio. The implication being that Cassio actually is at fault. Do you see? So nasty piece of work this this Iago guy so he goes through the rest of this long speech here basically laying out what we've already seen we go watch a film version of it and you'll see basically what happens here you don't need to you don't really don't need to read it again but look at how he coaches his language here again the psychopath presents himself as a concerned ally he says but men are men my lord the best sometimes forget themselves even good men like Cassio sometimes make mistakes do you see Othello buys it, and he says, "Thy honesty and love does mince this matter." Do you see? So you're you're mincing your words here, because you're trying to protect Cassio. There's Othello, the good-natured, trusting, naive guy. He sees what he expects to see. He's a noble character. He's a trusting character. He's an honest character, and he expects honesty in somebody else. So he believes what was Iago says. He doesn't. He, oh, he Othello has a shadow for sure. He's 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 a great he's a great warrior, but he's 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 very naive in other instances as well. And psych psychologically, like Macbeth, my, Macbeth was a strong warrior, but psychologically very weak. Uh, Othello maybe is the same kind of character. Anyway, there there we go. Mastermind, masterclass in manipulation. Cassio, I love thee, but never more be officer of mine. So there it is. The peripatia has happened. The, the reversal of fortune, Cassio was, was, was in condition A as a good, noble, respected officer, and now he is uh, an outcast. He's lost his reputation. Um, so Othello tells Iago to take care of the town and calm everybody down after this major brawl that was going on. And then everybody leaves except for Iago and Cassio. And Cassio is licking his wounds. And of course, good old honest Iago, the good friend, the caring, concerned ally, the hugs, the hugs, the hugs. Cassio's bemoaning his loss of reputation. Reputation, reputation, reputation. Oh, I have lost my reputation. Shakespeare repeats it a lot, which means it's got to be important. It's one of the big themes, the peripatia. You can, if you have your reputation one minute, it could be the appearance of reputation like Iago. Iago's reputation is that he's honest. That's pure appearance, do you see? The reality being that he's anything but, okay? And Iago will lose that reputation of being honest as well. So he will encounter his peripatia, but much, much too late. Go, I, I talk about this in my theme video. I have lost the immortal part of myself, and what remains is bestial. I'm a beast, 
my reputation, Iago, my reputation. So this reveals a lot about Cassio. His self-image, as I've mentioned already, is that of, it's in the Apollonian realm, the, the dutiful, conscientious, professional. Uh, he's got a weak sense of self that he even got himself into this mess to begin with. Okay, so that suggests that. Uh, he needs validation from public opinion. Look at the reputation, reputation, reputation. He's not, he's not concerned about He's not concerned about doing his job for Othello, I suppose. He's not saying, oh my goodness, I, 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 I can't serve my noble lord anymore. I can't help Othello rule anymore. I can't do my job anymore. He's more concerned about his reputation. Is that something, is, does that reveal something about him? Does that reveal a weakness? He's more concerned that people like him, do you see? He's needy in that sense, perhaps, okay? Uh, although it's, it's hard to judge because back in those days, you know, honor was a bigger deal than it is today. We, that, there was an, something called an honor culture up until about 150 or 200 years ago. Uh, we don't have an honor culture today. We have a different system of judging merit these days. Uh, but it used to be based on, on, on honor, and now he's lost that honorable position. So, yeah, it was a big deal. However, we can also talk about it in terms of, of him. This is pretty excessive. Maybe that we maybe we can also talk about in terms of the theme of excess versus moderation. Is he excessively obsessed with his reputation? Should he just man up and say, "Oh, all right, I've got a lot of work to do to 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 regain my place in the world." Why doesn't he do that? He doesn't. He's kind of like a Rodrigo, a pathetic little wormish kind of Rodrigo character. Maybe that's too harsh. You 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 figure it out. Um, look at what Iago does. He lies by telling the truth. He's the concerned ally. Alex, it's beautiful advice. It's real advice. Reputation, don't worry, Cassio. Reputation is an idle and most false imposition. Often got without merit. Reputation is often undeserved, and it's often lost without deserving. So you didn't deserve to lose your good reputation. So that's that's the, those are the whims of the world. Don't sweat it, Cassio. It's true. This is absolutely true. This is what a great psychopath does. They lie by telling the truth. Nasty, nasty business. Um, so they, they're, it, it's a buddy-buddy situation where Cassio is in, at the mercy of Iago because he's, he's, he's vulnerable now. He's emotionally vulnerable. Um, he makes a comment here, uh, which is also pretty, pretty true, but in this context, remember we talked about the blue and the yellow, the, 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 the contrast and the juxtaposition thing. In, in, in this particular context, even though what he's saying is true, uh, it, it's also a little bit pathological, a little bit puritanical. Look what he says here. He says, oh, good grief. Why do we put the enemy of ourselves, why do we drink alcohol is what he's saying. Why do we put the enemy of ourselves in our mouths that steal away our brains? True. Why do we do this? That we should with joy, pleasance, and revel and applause transform ourselves into beasts. Well, this I have a problem with. What's wrong with revels? What's wrong with applause of your, of your fellows? What's wrong with singing a bar song with your friends? Do you see? What's, what's wrong with a good time? Do you see? He conceives of it here as being a beast. Now, this on its own, if he's only talking about alcohol and making a fool of yourself when you're drunk, uh, perhaps that's correct. But we saw how he reacted earlier when he snapped himself out of it, when he was having fun. He was having fun with the gang, and then he got disgusted with himself because he, was, because he had sunk to the Dionysian uh, level. He was rolling around in the mud with his buddies, and he was ashamed of himself because he saw himself as this Apollonian figure. Um, so perhaps we can think of him as a Puritan here. Maybe this is another case. Um, you see what I'm trying to do here? I'm trying to build, I'm trying to write an essay for myself. Do you see? I'm trying to understand uh, the character of, of Cassio. That's what we do. Uh, a weak shadow, again, he's ashamed of himself. He couldn't stick up with him for himself earlier, and now he's ashamed. That might be part of that. It, it's all, all of this is excess versus moderation. Would he, would he, uh, would he not like simply having a tea party? And having fun and some laughs, he wouldn't. He wouldn't be ashamed of joy in that sense, you see. But this excess is what he, what he, what he dislikes about himself. And maybe he's correct. Um, baseness versus nobility. Of course, he sunk to the base and he hated himself for it. He sees himself as noble, and he wasn't. He didn't behave nobly, and so he hates himself for it. Uh, he beats himself up way too much, I think. Okay, so. Uh, Iago still trying to console him, still trying to console him. He's, 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 he's giving him advice here. Now we get now some of the important plot, plot elements kick in. He says, what am I going to do? Cassio says, what am I going to do? What should I do? Okay, what should I do? And Iago says, come, come, come. Okay, we'll, we'll figure this out. Um, I think you think I love you. Do you see what he's doing here? He's presenting himself as the concerned ally. And Iago eventually comes up with the advice. He says, look, look, we'll fix this man. Cheer up, cheer up, man up. 
cheer up. Just like Rodrigo, he's treating him just like he, tre he treated Rodrigo throughout the whole play. He says, confess yourself to Desdemona. Go to Desdemona, or does he talk about Emilia here? He says, the general's wife. No, Desdemona, the general's wife. Go talk to Desdemona. Uh, plead your case to Desdemona, because Desdemona has Othello's ear. Ask her to plead for you with Othello. Now, that's all part of Iago's plan, of course, because we've, as we've seen already, that the more Desdemona pleads Cassio's case to Othello, once Othello's primed to see the relationship between Cassio and Desdemona as not innocent, when, when Iago primes Othello to see with jealous eyes, then he does, Othello does see what he expects to see. So he's, getting, he's going to prime Othello to see uh, Desdemona's pleading uh, as evidence that Desdemona is actually having an affair with Cassio. Very, very complicated, very, very horrible, very, very nasty. Again, master class in psychopathology. Cassio then leaves and we get Iago's second soliloquy, which is a bit more interesting than, than the, the previous one that we saw, although there are some plot elements revealed in here. There, there, there's a bit more going on. So, he, so Iago, after that, after the council, remember he, 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 he counseled uh, Cassio to go talk to Desdemona to plead his case with, with Othello. And so he turns to the camera, if you watch one of the movie versions, and he says, and what's he that then that says, I play the villain? Who could call me villain? When this advice that I just gave Cassio is free and it's honest, and indeed it is, it is a good way. It's probable to thinking and indeed the course to win the more again. Isn't that the easiest way to, 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 for, for the more to change his mind is to have Desdemona, the woman that he adores, to, to plead his case? It makes logical sense. Again, there's the manipulator that lies by telling, tr uh, that, that lies by telling truths, truths as lies, and equivocation, of course. So let me walk you through the rest of this as well, because it is an important soliloquy. Um, for it is most easy, the inclining Desdemona to subdue in any honest suit it's easy for Desdemona to win her suit with Iago because, and here he's, he, he, here he, goes, he returns to his crude nature. He, he refers to her as a sexual creature. He says she's framed as fruitful as the free elements. Okay, so he's talking about her frame. He's talking about her body. Physically, she can seduce Othello to force him to do whatever she wants to do. It's crude. It has nothing to do with the marriage of true minds. It's all uh, physical attraction or the relations between men and women as purely physical and manipulative sex as manipulation so there, there's another crude element introduced and then for her to win the more were it to renounce his baptism she could convince the more to renounce his Christianity all seals and symbols of redeemed sin his soul is so unfettered to her love he is so in love with her that he would do anything he would renounce his baptism that she may make unmen, unmake do whatever she wants with him even as her appetite shall play the God with his weak function here is, here is an interesting image. He, again, we see what we want to see. He sees the powers of Desdemona in the way that he sees his own powers to control other people. She can use her sexuality to control her husband. That's how he sees that relationship. It's corrupt to the core. It's a swamp. It's a horrible way of looking at things. Uh, she can can play the god like I'm playing the god. I'm the puppet master and she is a puppet master in her own right. We see what we want to see. We project onto the world the good that we have in us or the the ill that we have in us. So he turns to the camera and he says, well, how am I a villain then? Because this is to counsel Cassio to this parallel course directly to his good. He's not lying. It ain't a lie. It's actually true. But of course, it's a, a lie from hell. It's divinity of hell. Uh, this this is a, this is this is important. This has this is a theme that's actually uh, this equivocation theme uh, is, is 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 explored even more in Macbeth. He says, Iago says, when devils will the blackest sins put on, when the devils are about to do their worst, what do they do? They do suggest first with heavenly shows, as I do now. So if you want to trap somebody, if you want to trick somebody, if you want to manipulate somebody, you 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 it's the the bait and switch. You bait them with with goodness, you bait them with truths, and once you've got them, once they trust you, that's when you can spring your trap. Uh, that's exactly what uh, what what's going on in Macbeth as well. And Banquo, if you remember, warns Macbeth against that when the witches the witches say two remember the other prophecies in Macbeth? You remember Macbeth. The two prophecies come true. And so that convinces Macbeth that the third one must also be true. Um, anyway, okay, so for whilst this honest fool plies Desdemona to repair his fortune, so the honest fool being Cassio, so as 
Cassio talks to Desdemona to, to plead his case to the Moor. And, and she, for him, pleads strongly to the Moor. What's he going to do? So as this is going on, I'll pour this pestilence into his ear. I'll prime Othello to see all of, all of Desdemona's pleading as evidence that she actually loves Cassio. And that that's a nasty scene that, that's coming up. That's a really nasty scene. That she repeals him for her body's lust. That, that means she's, she's begging for his reinstatement uh, as a lieutenant because she lusts. There it is again. Okay, there's not love. He doesn't even conceive of love. You know, he could have said to Othello, you know what? Desdemona actually loves Cassio. He doesn't. It's lust. There's no such thing as love. A psychopath can't love. So any physical attraction between the sexes has to be lust because there's nothing, no, nothing else exists for those guys. It's sad, really, really sad. Uh, and by how much she strives to do him good, she shall undo her credit with the more. The more she pleads with Othello, the more she's going to make herself look bad. So I will turn her virtue into pitch. Virtue, of course, is the Apollonian. Pitch is like tar. It's a sticky, gross, uh, 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 earthy matter. Uh, tar. It's tar, basically. So I will turn the Apollonian into the crude Dionysian. I don't want to be so cruel to Dionysian. Di Dionysus is a pretty decent, decent god. But, but yeah, too, yeah, too much of him and, and, and you're in bad shape. And out of her goodness, make the net that shall enmesh them all. That's what a manipulator does. He's going to use their goodness. He's going to use the, he knows people. A psychopath knows people. He knows that she has got good in her and she projects that goodness onto the world. She sees what she expects to see in the world and a good manipulator, a good psychopath will use that against a person. So be careful. The sick puppy Rodrigo crawls back on stage whining that he's been He's been exceedingly well cudgeled. He's been beaten up. He's lost all his money. He's given all his money to, to, to Iago for nothing. He's just going to return to Venice with, with no Desdemona. Boo-hoo, boo-hoo. That's exactly what I Iago says. He says, be patient. Uh, by, yeah, you, you, you took a few knocks, but don't worry. That was in, that was in a good cause because by, getting, by, by taking those knocks, we've actually got Cassio where we want him. So patience, patience. He, he, he really, he talks to his, the tone uh, he, he, he doesn't have to soft touch. He doesn't have to soft touch Rodrigo anymore. He's got Rodrigo really, really where he wants him. And so he can start to, uh, he can start to talk to him as, as, as Rodrigo deserves. He's a dog. He's a dog that deserves to be kicked. He's so pathetic. And look at, look at the way he talks to him here. He says, um, away, I say, thou shalt no more hereafter. Nay, get thee gone. And then Rodrigo slinks out. It's really cruel. It's, it's really horrible. It reveals a lot about uh, Iago, of course, but it reveals a lot about Rodrigo. Again, we get zero backstory about Rodrigo, but what on earth would, would, would allow a person to be kicked around like that? It's, it's really, really sad. There's something really bizarre going on with Rodrigo. Anyway, again, a little minor soliloquy here, a bit of an aside, I suppose we could call it. Uh, it's just plot stuff. He says, two things are to be done. Uh, Emilia, my wife, must move for Cassio to her mistress. So uh, he's going to ask uh, Emilia to plead Cassio's case to Desdemona to reinforce Desdemona's pleading uh, to Othello. I'll set her on. Again, look at the manipulative, uh, manipulative language here. Myself, while that's happening, what am I going to do? I'm going to draw the more apart, so on a separate part of the stage, and bring him up exactly, that means exactly, exactly where he may, he may Cassio find soliciting his wife. So, he's go, so when, when Cassio's talking to Desdemona, hopefully they'll be touching each other because Cassio's always touching people. He's a touchy-feely kind of guy, remember? So, that, so, so Iago's got to position uh, Othello so that he can witness the two of them talking, DC. That's the way. Dull, not device by coldness and delay. So I, gotta, I got the plan. The plan is, is ready to move. Uh, I've got to take advantage of it now. So everything's set. And that's the end of Five Quotes Shakespeare Othello Act 2, Scene 2 and 3, which is the end of the act. Come back for my next video when we start Act 3. Thanks for watching.